Okay, so today the uh, sermon is about the gift of tongues. I just wanted to follow on from the sermon two weeks ago when we talked about laying on of hands, because uh, they are related, uh, but this one I want to talk specifically about the gift of tongues. Um, now, you know, this, this, this uh, doctrine is probably, uh, you know, more <laughs> popular amongst the Pentecostal church. If you think of a Pentecostal church, um, you know, it's based after Acts 2 and the way they practice the gift of tongues. That's what I'm sort of preaching about today. I want to go to all the different passages that talk about tongues and where they get this idea that it's this angelic language and how they practice it. And when you look at the passages in the Bible, you'll notice that the way it's practiced within the Pentecostal church is completely unbiblical, right? It's completely unbiblical. But today I want to give you an idea of what the gift of tongues is. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, in Pentecostal churches, they believe that, you know, we, like we talked about two weeks ago, where they'll lay their hands on people, they'll get the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then people will be overcome by the Holy Spirit, and then they'll speak in what they believe to be an unknown tongue. But to them, if you've ever seen it practiced, it's just gibberish, right? Like they'll be standing there, they're praying, and then they'll start saying things like sha la 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 and then other things like, like they'll fall on the floor doing the same thing. And it's, it's quite crazy if you've never experienced it. And with that in mind, when you, when you read, when we go through 1 Corinthians 14, you'll get an idea of how it shouldn't be practiced, but that's not even, um, you know, the actual real gift of tongues and what it is. So we're going to talk about some different aspects here today. Hopefully you um, learn a bit about the gift of tongues from a biblical point of view. So we're going to talk about, like, you know, what are tongues? Have they ceased? And then we'll look at two main passages in the Bible uh, about tongues, which is Acts and 1 Corinthians 14. So first section is, what are tongues? Now, besides the actual physical body part, right, the tongue, because it, the, the Bible does obviously use the word in that, instance as well but when the bible talks about the tongue like your body part it's generally referring to the things that you say right <coughs> the things that you talk about like in james 3 it says even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things right so the tongue is what gives you the ability to speak right and people lose their tongue they, they can't phrase their words anymore behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth and the tongue is a fire a world of iniquity so is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. So we have the actual body part. Now besides that, the Bible uses the word tongues to refer to different languages. So Revelation 7, 9, it says, After this I beheld and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds Right, so nations, you know, we know what nations are. Kindreds is who you descend from. People and tongues, right? These are different languages. Stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. <clears throat> and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. So we see here in Revelation 9, 11 as well, the way the word tongue is used. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in the Hebrew tongue, so you see there, so it's just not so like, you know, uh, something that, you know, just some angelic thing where people don't really know what's being said. It's a, the, you, the word tongue is being used to describe a language. The Hebrew tongue or Hebrew language is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue has his name Apollyon. Now, where do people get this idea of this angelic language they think when we speak in the with the gift of tongues that we're speaking in an angelic language well this is where they get the idea from first corinthians 13 this is the only place um, you know so if you're wondering oh how do they justify thinking that they can speak in angelic languages this is the passage first corinthians 13. so paul says here in first corinthians 13 he says though i speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity i am become as sounding brass or a tinkling symbol. Now, if you read that first passage, you might think, and this is how they interpret it. Right? They say, you see, Paul spoke in an angelic language. Right? That's what you think when you read that passage. That's what you think it's saying. He's saying, because you, you read this and think it means, even though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, so love, I become a sounding brass or a tinkling, tinkling sim, sim, symbol. Now, is that... Is that what's being said well we read 
the rest of the chapter, we'll see that that's not what though means. Verse 2, and though I have the gift of prophecy, so Paul did have that, and understand all mysteries, well, he didn't understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, right? There's definitely some things he didn't know. And though I have all faith so that I can move mountains, I have not charity, I am nothing. So the point he's making here in 1 Corinthians 13 is it doesn't matter if he has all these abilities and all these things. If he doesn't have love, then he's nothing. Love is sort of like the multiplier. And if you have zero, multiplies it by zero. Now look at verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, see, did Paul do that? No. And have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Right, so Paul is not saying that he does all these things, right? What does though mean? Though doesn't mean even though, like how well, we would think when we first read it. What it means is even if he did these things. That's what he means by it. So it's, if you read it again, he's like, hey, even if I could speak with the tongues of men and of angels, if I have not charity, i have become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Even if I had the gift of prophecy and understand all mystery. So you see how he's not listing all these things that he actually does or he actually has. He's just saying, even if I did these things, if I don't have charity, then I've become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Or not. Though I have faith that I can remove out. And even if, see, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned. So he, he didn't do these things, right? And that's why you can see when he says, though I do these things, he's saying, even if I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. So he's saying, even if I have all these abilities, all this sacrifice, if I don't have charity, I am nothing. So he's not claiming here that he spoke in angelic languages, right? He's just saying that even though he could do these things, or even if he could do these things, it wouldn't matter if he didn't have charity, right? So that's one thing. But this is where they get this idea that Ah, you see, believers can speak in angelic languages, but that's not even what Paul is really saying here, right? So they get this idea that the gift of tongues is about speaking an angelic language. This is where they get it from. The other idea they have is, you know, this idea that the gift of tongues is being able to speak in, in a language that nobody understands at all. And... They get it from this passage here in Romans 8, 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. So I don't know if you've ever heard the argument where, you know, you might be speaking with a Pentecostal and then they say, oh, you know, I speak in tongues. And you say, well, why do you do that? And they say, well, because when I pray, you know, I don't always know what I'm praying, and therefore I, you know, I'm going to speak in these unknown tongues. Right? So that's one idea there. Another idea they have is, you know, well, we want to pray in this unknown tongue because when I pray to God, you know, they don't want Satan to, like, understand their prayers. I don't know if you've ever heard that one, right, where they say, you know, I pray in this unknown tongue that Satan can't intercept my prayers, and even if he does, you know, he doesn't understand what, what they're saying. Now, that reasoning is kind of, kind of odd because one thing is, if Satan knows you're praying, what does it matter whether he knows you're praying or not? He probably doesn't like the fact that you're praying. So, first of all, it doesn't matter if Satan can understand your prayers or not. If you're praying, it's probably a good thing. It's probably something he doesn't like. The second thing is, you know, Satan is not God. So some people have this idea that Satan is like God. He can read your mind. And that's not the case. You know, Satan is a created being. He's not om omniscient. He's not omnipresent. He's very powerful, right? He can do a lot of supernatural things. But he can't read your mind. So, you know, if somebody's really concerned about Satan hearing their prayers, they just don't need to say their prayers out loud, right? Because if you, if you don't say your prayers out loud, Satan can't read your mind, but God obviously can. But they get this sort of, uh, this, the, these thoughts that, you know, this is why I'm praying in an unknown tongue, uh, you know, and, and they have many other reasons, and I could probably spend, you know, hours and hours talking about all the different reasons, um, but those are some of the more common ones. Now, the thing about, they say, okay, well, when we pray to God and we don't always know what we're praying, does the Spirit intercede for us? Yes, right? This is what this passage is saying. But is it making you pray in a language that you don't understand, in an angelic language, and that's what it means? No, because look at, I, I, I purposely didn't read the whole passage. Because if you read the whole verse, it says here, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, 
for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So sometimes we don't know what to pray, right? And it, the Spirit kind of works like a, as a translator for us to you know, pass on to God what, what we should be praying, even though we don't even always know what we should be praying. It says, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, look at this, which cannot be uttered. Now that's not what they believe, right? They believe when the, the Spirit intercedes for them, they can utter because they're uttering it, right? But this is actually saying, hey, these groanings that the Spirit is doing on behalf of us, it can't be uttered by us. It's not something that we speak, because if obviously we, we spoke it, we would know what we were praying, right? But it's when we don't know what we are praying, meaning we don't know what to pray for, not that we don't know what we're saying, that the Spirit will intercede for us, right? So that's where they, they get that idea from. That's a couple of verses there. Now, let's go on to the second section. Second section is, have tongues ceased? Have tongues ceased? Now, I believe they have, right? And I sort of went into it two sermons, or the last sermon when we talked about the laying out of hands, and, and we'll cover that just briefly again in this sermon. But this is where, in 1 Corinthians 13, if you were to ask, you know, most Christians, do they believe that gifts have ceased? Do they believe tongues have ceased? They will generally take you to this passage in 1 Corinthians 13. Now, we'll, we'll read through this. I'll explain what it's saying, and I'll explain why I don't think it's a strong enough uh, verse to sort of show that tongues no longer apply today. But in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 8, it says here, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. So if you remember, we were reading the first part of 1 Corinthians 13 just before when we were talking about um, you know, the tongues of men and of angels, because that's the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the context of 1 Corinthians 13, about love. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Right? So there are things that are sort of half revealed in today's day. And they're saying there's coming a time when these things that are in part uh, will no longer be here. Right? So there are prophecies, things that you know, haven't come to pass yet, you know, parts of God's word that are still to be fulfilled. It says, hey, they shall fail. They'll go away, right? Because they're going to be fulfilled. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So this is the passage, this is the verse where people say, well, that which is perfect is come. When that comes, then these things that are in part, like the tongues and the prophecies and the knowledge, those things are going to cease. But the question is, what is this, that which is perfect? So the argument is often in fundamental circles. They'll say like, well, that which is perfect is obviously talking about God's word. And they'll say, because the Bible is here now and it's confirmed, that's why the, the, these tongues and these gifts have ceased. But you can see it doesn't actually say when God's word is complete, right? It just says when that which is perfect is come. That's how they're interpreting it as. Now, I don't believe that's the best understanding of this passage because when we go on to verse 11, it says, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly. So what is that referring to? I, I believe that is referring to God's word where right now we don't, see things 100% clearly, right? We read God's word, we see through the eyes of faith. Faith. But look at verse 12. But then, face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. Right? So he's saying we, right now we know in part because we look through a glass darkly through the words of the Bible and we get a picture of things that are to happen and we get a picture of Jesus Christ. But one day, we're going to meet Jesus Christ face to face. And that's what I believe it is referring to when it says that which is perfect is come. It's referring to when Jesus returns and we'll actually see him face to face. When I became, verse 13, now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. So that's the passage that most people will go to when they, when they talk about, hey, have tongues cease. I don't think 
it's strong enough to sort of show, well, just because we have the Bible today, that therefore tongues have ceased, because I think this passage is actually referring to when Jesus returns again. But why do I still think tongues have ceased today? Well, we talked about it in the last sermon, but we'll just brush on it again in Acts 8. But if you remember, when we talked about the laying on of hands and the giving on of gifts, I believe that that was a power that was only given to the apostles. And this is why uh, Philip did not have it when he went down to Samaria. He had to wait for the apostles to come to give the gift of the Holy Ghost onto other people. Acts 8 verse 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. So if you remember what's happening here in Acts 8, Philip is already down there, you know, doing all sorts of miracles and, you know, preaching the gospel down in Samaria. They've received the word of God. People are getting baptized, but they haven't received the Holy, the Spirit, uh, the, the gift of the Holy Ghost yet, these gifts that were given by the apostles in the early church. Verse 15, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. So you remember that story where Simon the sorcerer had bewitched him for a long time. He saw the apostles come down and wanted to you know, get that power of that Holy Ghost being passed on, and he offered them money. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. So why do I believe it has ceased? Because the gifts were being passed on by the apostles, right? And this, this, uh, this laying on of hands of the apostles no longer occurs because there's no longer any apostles. You know, Paul was the last apostle, and we see here in Acts 8 that Philip was not able to give these gifts on, but the apostles were. Now, the other thing that we see in the New Testament is we see these gifts, even the gifts that the apostles had, we see them starting to wane, right? Like starting to, 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 to no longer have effect. What do I mean by that? Look in 1 Timothy 5. I mean, if you remember, Timothy had a gift, right? We don't know exactly what that gift was. But we know Paul had the gift to be able to heal and be able to do all sorts of miracles. But look at what he says to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5. He says, Drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Now, why would he be saying to Timothy, Hey, you know, take care of yourself. Don't drink you know, water anymore. Drink a little bit of wine for your stomach's sake and your often infirmities. Why didn't he just heal him? Well, it's because I believe that we see in the New Testament and in the New Testament epistles, we start to see the gifts that they were given in order to confirm the word with signs following, I think we're, we're starting to phase out. 2 Timothy 4, verse 19, Salute Prissa and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Did you say, Paul, like, why did you leave him sick there? Why didn't you heal him? Didn't you have the gift of the Holy Ghost? Well, like I said, it's because I think as time was going on, these gifts were given for a reason, and that reason was no longer there. What was that reason? Well, we saw, see in Mark 16, 17. This is when Jesus gives them, in Mark 16, the Great Commission, right? We, we, we know it's in uh, Matthew as well. And here it's in Mark. After he says, Go ye therefore into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 17, he says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. Because there were gifts given to them in the beginning and they were doing miracles and things like that. Why? In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. <laughs> so these are again <coughs> gifts that were given to the early church through the apostles. Um, but why? So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, look at this, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. 
So this does tie into the theory in 1 Corinthians 13 when people say when that which is perfect is come and that which is in part shall be done away because they believe that you know now the word is here these gifts are no longer needed in order to you know push and, and confirm the word with signs following. So we see here that was one of the reasons why uh, it was given. And we see going through the New Testament, right, it's starting to sort of phase out. Now, we're going to spend a bit more time in the passages that talk about tongues, right? So that's Acts 2 and 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to look at tongues in the Bible. Now, if you were to ask the Pentecostal, or why are they called the Pentecostal Church? Well, it's because of the day of Pentecost. So we're going to go to the day of Pentecost, and we're going to look at when the gift of tongues was given, right? And you tell me, as we, you know, read through this passage and look at it, is this what we see being practiced in the Pentecostal Church today? Acts 2 verse 1, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So you remember they were all hiding, you know, uh, they, was, they were scared before the Holy Ghost uh, fell upon them at the day of Pentecost. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So you can see here, oftentimes when maybe you watch a, a movie portrayal, um, you will you know, see the room, you know, everything's blowing around and, you know, because they, they get this idea that a, a wind came into the room when the, the Holy Ghost came in. But you can see here, it says here, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. So was it, was it a wind that filled the house? No, it was the sound of a wind that filled the house. All right, so just thought I would <laughs> point out that difference there. So... Because I always, I always had the, I don't know about you guys, but I always had the impression that they were in that upper room and that everything was like blowing around, right? Because the wind was coming in. But then when I read it a bit closer, I realized, no, it, just, it was just a sound that filled the room, or the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. So again, this is something that in my mind, when I pictured, I thought there was flames on each of their heads. But what it actually is, it's actually... Clo a cloven tongue is like a snake's tongue, right? It's like a tongue that's split in half. So it's actually actual tongues on top of them, but the tongue is moving like as of fire. Right? So again, this is something that, just, just to create the visual, you know, I always thought that there was a flame on each of their heads, but it's actually, there's a tongue on each of their heads, and it is moving like as of fire. Right? And it's sat upon. So you can imagine, you know, like a, like a flame is like things. So the tongue is actually moving on top of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, if you were a Pentecostal and you read verse 1 to 4, you might get the idea like in a Pentecostal church where they're all sitting around and they're praying and then all of a sudden they just burst into all different languages and it's all crazy. But is, is that... What is happening? Is that what they're speaking with? Well, we go on to verse 5 and we can see. What are they actually saying? And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak, look at this, in his own language. Right, so there's no, you know, wonder what is going on here they're not just given just this gibberish that they're just saying and nobody understands what they're saying, right? They're given the gift of tongues. Why? To go out and preach the gospel on a, at, at a time when people from all over the world are coming to Jerusalem to celebrate. And they were all amazed. Who? The people that were at there at the day of Pentecost. These Jews devout men of every nation under heaven, right? Because they heard these people speak in their own language. So you can see it's being interchangeably used there, tongues and language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans, right? They're from Galilee. But how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Now, when you go and you hear a Pentecostal say all that gibberish, is that like the experience that people have? They hear them, they go, 
hey, this, this is a Chinese, like this is an Australian. How are they speaking Chinese? How are they speaking Greek? How are they speaking the language that I understand? No, most people, they look at people that are speaking all this gibberish and they, they think, I have no idea what they say. I don't think anyone knows. I don't even think they know what they, they're saying. And they don't know what they're saying. Right? How hear we, man, every man, how hear we, every man, in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Now the Bible is going to list out all these languages. Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues. What are these languages? The wonderful works of God. So you see how this gift of tongues was not given to build up the person and to show them how spiritual they were, right? Because that's what they'll say in Pentecostal churches. Like, hey, it's all based on your faith. Do you have the faith to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost? And then, ah, you know, the gift of the Holy Ghost is manifest. It's showing you that you're somebody full of faith. Was that the reason why the gift of tongues was given in Acts 2? No, the gift of tongues was given in order to preach the gospel, Right? There were people there from all over the world that didn't speak their language, so they were supernaturally given other languages in order to preach the word of God. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed. They were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Right? So other people were saying to them, look, you know, how these guys, because to them, they didn't understand the languages that were being spoken. So some people thought that they were a bit crazy too because, you know, obviously Galileans speaking in different languages. I mean, if you saw a Galilean speaking Chinese, you know, that looked quite odd to you as well as a Galilean. But as a Chinese person, you'd be thinking, you know, I can actually understand what these people are saying. How are they speaking my language? So that is Acts 2. Now let's spend some time in 1 Corinthians 14. Because in the Corinthian church, there were people that had the gift of tongues, but they were abusing that gift, right? They were misusing it. So you can see here how Paul corrects them, how it should be used correctly for people that did have that gift. But, you know, when you go to, if you've been to a Pentecostal church, they, they don't always practice it this way. They don't practice it this way where the, the directions that are given in 1 Corinthians 14 are meant to be followed. So let's go through this chapter together and I'll explain it to you as we read through it. 1 Corinthians 14. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. Now why is he saying this? Because in 1 Corinthians 12, if you go back and read it, Paul actually mentions these are the spiritual gifts. Now, 1 Corinthians 13, if you remember, is about charity. Because he's saying, hey, I want people to desire spiritual gifts, but let me show you an even better way. 1 Corinthians 13 is charity. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, you know, I've become a sounding brass as a tinkling symbol. So what Paul is trying to address is, yes, you can desire spiritual gifts. You don't want to be ignorant of spiritual gifts, but an even better way is charity, is love. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 is about. Then he goes on to 1 Corinthians 14. He says, hey, Follow after charity, right? That's the passage he's just talked about in 1 Corinthians 13. And desire spiritual gifts, but now he's giving us perspective to say, look, spiritual gifts are great, right? They're a good thing. They're not a bad thing. But look at what he says here. He says, but you know what's even better? Prophesy. Now, prophesy doesn't only mean telling the future, like how we think about it, like prophecies. Prophesy just means preaching God's word, right? So this could be teaching preaching God's word, you know, what I'm doing today. This is considered prophesying as well. So he's saying, hey, you want to follow after love, desire spiritual gifts, but rather, even something even better than having a spiritual gift is that you can teach other people the word of God. You can edify them. Verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. So he's saying there, hey, if you speak in a language that nobody understands, you're not speaking to them, right? You're speaking to God. That's what he's saying. And, but when you want to teach somebody, 
You want to be able to speak to them. You want them to understand. Verse 3, but he that prophesieth, right, he's teaching, speaketh unto men to edification. What does edification mean? It means to build people up. Right? You're giving them knowledge. You're helping them to understand. And exhortation, right? You're encouraging them to do what's right. And comfort, right? You give them some comfort in the Holy Ghost, in the truth of God's word. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue, look at this, edifieth himself. Right? If you speak in a language, even if you, you know, I mean, even if you do it today, right? Like, I mean, if I was to come up here and speak in a language, teach the Bible in a language that nobody understood, I mean, who am I benefiting then? The only one I'm lifting up is myself. Uh, people were using, in the Corinthian church, the gift of tongues in the wrong way as well, where they had the gift of tongues. They could speak in another language. They were using it. Nobody understood what they were saying. He's saying here, hey, if you speak in an unknown tongue, verse 4, all you're doing is building up yourself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Verse 5. I would that ye all spake with tongues. So Paul is saying here, hey, I wish everyone had this gift. But rather that ye prophesy. Why? For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues. Except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Isn't that interesting? Because in some churches that really glorify, and I think they, they are you know, not, not even practicing it correctly, these gifts, because I don't think they exist today, but the way the Pentecostal church practices it, you know, they think getting these gifts is much better. Right? But look at what the passage says. The passage says, no, it's actually better for you to be able to teach because there's no point speaking in an unknown tongue, unless you can interpret. Right? So there's no point speaking in an unknown language and nobody understands what you're saying because you want the church to receive edifying. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophecy or by doctrine? So he's saying, if I come to you speaking in a language you don't understand, it's not going to profit you unless I explain some things to you. And even things without life giving sound. So this, this sentence is maybe a bit odd if you haven't, you know, not that familiar with your Bible, but it says, and even things without life giving sound. So you might have read it like, even things without life giving sound, as though that's like one word. But... These are just talking about like instruments and things like that, because we talk about the trumpet later. So he's saying, even things without life that give sound, right? Even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harp? So he's comparing, you know, speaking a language and people understanding what you're saying the same as a, a musical instrument that is being used to make a call. It needs to give a specific call and a specific meaning so people understand what it means. Verse 8, For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? So you know, like in these olden days, they would use musical instruments and trumpets to communicate across, you know, what now we got radios and all that sort of thing. But even on radios in the army, they have certain protocols and how they talk and they say, you know, I'm starting and stopping and how they, you know, they say copy that. This is all about, you know, making sure things are, are clear and understood. Verse 9. So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world and none of them is without signification. What does that mean? None of them is without meaning. What is its significance? What does it signify? This is without meaning. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. So Paul is saying, if I don't understand what people are saying, it's going to be like they're a foreigner to me. So you might say, you may think being a barbarian means you think people are crazy. Because we use that term today, right? We say, oh, somebody's a barbarian, or they're, you know, we say, well, maybe they're uncivilized. But that's not necessarily the case in the Bible. Barbarians in the Bible aren't necessarily uncivilized. It just means that um, they're like a foreigner or a native. 
Acts 28 verse 2, look what it says here, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. You can see that they can be quite civilised, they can be quite hospitable. For they kindled a fire and received us every one because of the present rain and because of the cold. So he's not <laughs> saying there that people are necessarily being uncivilised. He's just saying that, you know, they're a barbarian. We don't understand each other. We're coming from different, different uh, nations. Verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. So it's, he's saying here to the Corinthians, hey, it's great that you desire spiritual gifts, but you want to, again, he's just drilling it in. You want to be able to profit the church and edify the church. That is much better for the church. Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So if somebody's going to speak in an unknown language in a church, they need to be able to interpret. There's no point them speaking in an unknown tongue and nobody understands what they're saying. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So you can see there that, that, that it seems like there were some people that had the gift to be able to just speak a different language, but they didn't always understand themselves what they were saying. Right? That's why they needed to be the gift of interpretation as well. So people would say, ah, you know, that is a different language, and you can interpret it and interpret what revelation they're being given by God. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. This is the ideal scenario. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. Verse 16, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen at thy giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. Saying, hey, if you are preaching in a church in an unknown language, how is the people, how are the people that are listening be able to agree with what you're saying if they don't understand it? Right? Verse 17, for thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. Right? So you might be doing a good job speaking in an unknown language, but if it doesn't help anyone, they're not edified. Verse 18, Paul says, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than ye all. So Paul did have the gift of tongues. He did speak in various languages. But look at verse 19, Yet in the church, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So you see how even though Paul had this gift of tongues. He said, hey, I would rather say five words that help somebody than 10,000 words that nobody understands. So somebody getting up, praying, teaching, saying all that gibberish does not do anyone any good. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that Will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Verse 22. This is interesting here. He says, Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Now, what's interesting about this is, you know, when you... If you've been to, and I know I'm like talking about the Pentecostals today because the Pentecostals are really like, they're the ones that are big on this gift of tongues. But if you were to go to a Pentecostal church and they say, hey, this person, you know, they, they, they're praying, they, they receive the gift of the tongues, right? Now, they would say that that's a sign to that person that they, you know, that they have the faith and that they have received this gift from God. But is that the purpose of the gift of tongues? In verse 22, it says, wherefore tongues are for a sign. Is it a sign for the, the person? Is it a sign to the believers to show like, hey, God is present here and God is falling down on people? No, it's not a sign to the believers. It is a sign to, you know, to them that don't believe. But if the person who doesn't believe has no idea what's being said, how is it a sign to them? Right? This is why the, the, the gift of tongues was a language that unbelievers could understand, right? Because it was to, to, to preach to them for. But to them that believe not, but prophesying, see, teaching serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. 
If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? What is mad in the Bible? Crazy. Right? Because you come into a church, they're all speaking different languages, they're going to say, what's going on here? This is, this is, this is crazy. But if all prophesy, right, what does that mean? If they're all teaching the word of God in a language that they can understand, and they come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he doesn't know the Bible, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. See the difference there? So you've got one where they're misusing the gift of tongues. You say, hey, if unbelievers come in, they're going to think you're crazy. But if you're teaching the word of God, then they'll come in, they'll hear the word of God, and then they will worship God with you. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you had the psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things done be, be done unto edifying. So it's the same context in 1 Corinthians 14. What is the purpose of church? What is the purpose of getting together? So people learn and they're edified, they grow and they understand things. So first of all, he's addressing the misuse of tongues. And now he's saying, hey, things done in church need to be done decently and in order. You know, just come together and there's just disorder within the church. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course. What does that mean? By course, it means one after another. But when you go to these Pentecostal churches, right, and you see how they practice this, everyone's just speaking in tongues at the same time. Is that how it's meant to be practiced? No. How is it meant to be done? If they do indeed have a gift of tongues, and they're speaking, they take turns and they interpret what's being said so that people can be edified by it and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, look at this, if there is no interpreter for these tongues, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So you see, in a church where somebody's supposedly saying these, you know, has the gift of tongues and supposedly speaking out, should they be doing that? No, because if you can't interpret what you're saying, the, the Bible says they should be silent. Let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. Right? So it's about teaching the church. Verse 32, look at this. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. What is that verse saying? That verse is saying that when somebody is preaching in the spirit and they're filled with the spirit, they're still in control of themselves. Right? The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. It's not that the spirit overcomes you and then you just lose control. Right? You have no idea, you blank out. Right? You ask people, like, what happened when you spoke in tongues? They're like, I'm not too sure, I blanked out. That's not a good sign, right? That it's the Spirit of God working in you, right? Because the Spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Verse 34, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the Lord. So the, see, this passage is all about how the church should be run, who should be teaching, and things like that. So, you don't want to read this passage and think that, you know, well, you're not allowed to talk while you're in this building. You're not allowed to talk to anyone here. This, if you see the context, it is about teaching the congregation. So when it says, let your women keep silence in the churches, it's meaning a woman shouldn't get up and address the congregation. For it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. So some people misunderstand these passages. And if they will learn anything... Let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Again, I think this one is a bit misunderstood. <clears throat> what I think it means is it doesn't mean that if you have a question about the sermon or you want to talk about the Bible you know, at church that you can't like, go and you know, ask somebody. Right? You can only ask. Because people will say, well, what if I don't have a husband at home? That's not what I think this is passage is talking about. I think what is happening in 1 Corinthians 14 is like people are getting revelations. 
right? They're getting knowledge from God that they're sharing with the church. And it's saying here, even if a woman is revealed something, she shouldn't get up and preach it to the church. And if she is revealed something, if they do learn something from the Spirit, then they may need to address it with a man first, so then a man can then share that with the church. Why? Because it's a shame for women to speak in the church. It's not a women's, woman's place to address the church and address the congregation. Verse 36, a few verses left. What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet or desire to prophesy. Right? So you can see how covet is just a word that just means to desire something. So the, the sin is to covet your other people's property. But he's saying here, there are some good things to covet. Right? Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. That's what you want to desire to do, to be able to teach others and forbid not to speak with tongues. Right? So, you know, it's, we shouldn't stop people from speaking in tongues if they have the gift, but they just need to do it in the right way. Let all things be done decently and in order. So, in conclusion... Now, has the gift of tongues ceased? Now, I, I believe it has for the reasons that I've outlined in this sermon. But I think what we see being practiced by the Pentecostal church, you know, when we went through Acts 2, we went through 1 Corinthians 14, that's not the picture you're getting when you go to a Pentecostal church and you see just people just talking in angelic language, all talking at the same time, no interpreter, right? Now, I don't believe gifts still occur, uh, gifts still occur today, but... If they claim it is, you know, they're not practicing it the way the Bible outlines in 1 Corinthians 14. Now, the, the modern tongue-speaking movement that you see in Pentecostal churches, you know, is it fake? Is it satanic? You know, I, I don't want to say, you know, one or the other, but I think in some instances it is. In some instances where people are saying they're losing control, they have no idea what they're saying, they blank out, they come back to, and they don't know what's going on, I think there is something satanic going on there. Because like the Bible says, the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. But in some instances, people are just pretending. You know, people are just faking it as well. So there's a lot of that too. But hopefully today you learn a bit about the gift of tongues, you know a bit more about it, you're more familiar with the passages, and, and you won't you know, fall into the, the trap of these sorts of doctrines. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the, uh, you know, many passages you give us on tongues so that we can see uh, what they were, how they were used. And uh, I pray, Lord, um, that we would have this understanding so that, uh, you know, we would not get carried away with um, these sorts of practices. So I pray, Lord, uh, for uh, your word this morning. Pray that uh, it was understandable. Pray that it helped people. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.